Good morning, and welcome to Charleston Baptist Church. We are so glad you are worshiping with us today. At this time, we ask that you direct your attention to the video screens for this week's highlighted announcements. This month's mission and prayer focus is the North American Mission Board and the Annie Armstrong Offering. 100% of all donations given through the offering support more than 2,200 missionaries across North America. Please continue to lift up our missionaries in prayer as they plant churches, disciple new believers, and share the gospel with people across North America. Prayer guides are located in all the lobbies around campus. If you'd like to give, please designate your offering to the NAMB or Annie Armstrong. The Charleston Baptist Egg Hunt is right around the corner, and we need your help before, during, and after the event. There are spots for any student or adult that would like to volunteer. To learn more about how you can volunteer, please visit the Next Steps page on the church website and open the Egg Hunt volunteer link, or feel free to stop by the Next Steps desk following the worship service. Have you ever wondered how it is possible to have peace amidst all the external conflict of the world and internal chaos of life? The Low Country Biblical Counseling Center, in conjunction with Charleston Baptist Church, is hosting the Be at Peace Biblical Change Conference right here on campus Saturday, April 2nd. For more information, please visit the Next Steps page on the church website. And once again, we welcome you to Charleston Baptist Church. If you are a first-time guest, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to stop by the Next Steps desk by the Lighthouse after the service so that we can meet you and give you a welcome gift. And that is all of our highlighted announcements this week. Our worship service will begin shortly. We hope you have a blessed week and pray that we will see you again next Sunday, if not before.
Bless your name this morning. Acknowledge it, Lord, your presence in this place. Acknowledge it, who you are. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, as we come before you, Lord, Lord, just, Lord, just pour your spirit out on us today, Lord, as we worship you. Lord, thank you for bringing us through another week. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you continue to bless us with daily, Lord, when we don't deserve them. We know that they only come from you, Lord. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, we thank you for the gift of music. Lord, we thank you for the gift of being able to worship you through music. So, Lord, I pray right now that our voices would be a sweet sound to your ear. Lord, as we sing today, that we would just sing with all that we have, Lord, knowing that we have an audience of one this day, and that's you, Jesus Christ. Lord, we just ask that your spirit would move right now, and Lord, that you would be 
glorified through all this time. We thank you for what you're doing right now. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's sing it together. Come thou fount every bless to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest grace. Teach me some how love you sung it. Sung thy fading tongues above. Praise the mountain. Fix upon it. Mount of thy I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. And I was found by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul.
morning brothers and sisters what an honor it is today to uh, be a part of a baptism and I uh, want to introduce to you this is Dallas West and his son Jacob and uh, he, he's got a question <clears throat> Jacob has there been a time in your life where you have put your faith in Jesus as the only one who can take away your sin and make you right with God yes. <laughs> amen brother we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, raised to walk in a new life. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness of sin. And as we've seen this morning on baptism, Lord, the death, burial, and resurrection that it reminds us of, and that we identify with. Father, I thank you for, for that, that picture that you have given us. Father, may we be reminded of the grace that we have received in you. May we worship you in spirit and truth. And as my brother Jacob has confessed with his mouth and believed in his heart that you are Lord and that you have saved him from his sin, Father, that we would come alongside him as a church, as a family, to help raise him to know you, to love you, and to seek after your face. Father, we are saved not to ourselves, but we are saved to the body of Christ. Lord, you have given us this beautiful family to be a part of, and may we join in in the raising of, uh, of these students, of these kids, of those that come, Lord, that we would encourage one another, that we would hold each other accountable, that we would love one another. Father, I thank you for this time that we were able to, to be together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, church family. I'm Sean Byrne, the worship pastor here at Charleston Baptist Church. And we have some critical volunteer needs that I'm going to share with you this morning. We could really use some volunteers in the CB worship ministry. We are looking for people who can play acoustic guitar, electric guitar, bass guitar, drums, or keyboard. Volunteer instrumentalists serve on a consistent rotational basis during Sunday morning worship services. We could also use more people to be on our tech team to run lights, computer, camera, or sound. No special skills or experiences needed. All you need is a servant's heart and a willingness to learn. Volunteers on the tech team also serve on a consistent rotational basis on Sunday mornings. Our CB Kids first through fifth grade ministry has some volunteer openings. They are in need of two people to help facilitate and teach every other week on Sunday mornings at either 11 o'clock a.m. or 9.15 a.m. And they are in need of two substitutes to fill in when needed on Wednesday evenings, and they also need one teacher to help in classrooms with teaching on Wednesday evenings. Our CB Kids Infant through K-5 ministry can always use volunteers on Sunday mornings at either hour or on Wednesday evenings. Volunteers in this ministry serve on a rotational basis. If you are unsure as to where you should serve right now, would you pray about where God would have you use your gifts, talents, and abilities here at Charleston Baptist Church? If you are ready to start serving now or in the near future, please contact the church office or you can speak with me at the Next Steps desk following the worship service today. Thank you so much. Hey Amen. It's so good to be here this morning. As you can tell, we have definitely some needs within our ministries, and I would just encourage you, uh, as we think about the core values of our church, when we think about the importance of healthy discipleship, worship, grow, connect, and serve, uh, all those areas are equally important. And so as you examine where you are in your walk with the Lord, uh, if one of those areas is missing, I would encourage you to pray. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom and give you insight and discernment and desire and power and passion 
uh, to fulfill those particular desires that God has for us to be healthy disciples. The key of healthy discipleship is that wherever you're at, if it be at 13 San Miguel where we're meeting right now on campus, if you're joining with us online or when you go to work or wherever you're at, you are a healthy disciple. And when we look at Jesus's life and how he ministered to his original disciples, that's exactly what he impressed on them. Worship, grow, connect, serve. So if you're not a part of a life group and you have questions about what that means, please let us know. If you have questions about how to serve or where to serve, please let us know. Go to our next step area. Uh, we'd love to help you out with that right after our worship services today. As we consider opportunities for missions today, uh, there are two mission opportunities that we have specifically uh, in the next uh, few weeks. One is on campus here at uh, Charleston Baptist Church. On April the 9th, we're going to be hosting an Easter egg hunt for uh, not only our church family, but also our community. It's a way that we can just show the love of Christ through hospitality, through the gospel. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to share a meal together. It's, it's an awesome uh, opportunity for us uh, to just engage our community in a way that maybe we wouldn't be able to do uh, otherwise. And so if you are going to participate in that, we encourage you to register. Uh, if you need help registering, you can go to our Next Step area or go to our church website uh, through our Next Step tab and you can register there. Also, if you have a place of service that you're interested in, or maybe you want to find out all the other places, all the places that we have to serve, uh, we would encourage you to do that. There's some things that need to happen before April 9th, and then obviously there are things that we need to do on April 9th. But anything that you can provide assistance with, uh, it would be a tremendous blessing to us. Also, uh, our Southern Baptist Convention, uh, through our SID network, our North American Mission Board, uh, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, provides uh, missionary support all throughout uh, North America. And the encouraging part is, is God is planning people in specific areas within North America uh, to help revitalize those areas. And so we want to be a part of that. And so you can give a love offering. If you've not already done so in our main gathering area, uh, there's a pamphlet that looks just like this. I would encourage you to pick that up. There's places that you can uh, commit to pray uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, and also an opportunity to give a love offering above the tithe. As we continue to worship the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord says in Psalm 86, says, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. What a beautiful phrase, unite my heart to fear your name. In other words, don't have any divided places in my life. And he goes on to say, I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered me, delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we present our offerings and his ties to him today. Lord, we are so thankful for this opportunity to worship you. Lord, as we think about just the blessing of it is to be a part of your family, not, not because uh, we present uh, great characteristics before you, but Lord, because you are a gracious God. And Lord, let us be reminded each and every day that it is by grace through faith that we are saved. Lord, I pray that as uh, the students are returning from Extreme Weekend in just a little bit, uh, Lord, we pray that it was a fruitful time for them as they've grown in fellowship and relationship with you and they've grown in relationship and fellowship uh, with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Lord, as we think about uh, our church family, Lord, so many different needs that are happening within our family, financial, relational, spiritual, mental, emotional. Lord, I just pray that we would be a body of Christ that loves one another. Lord, that we would use the scripture and allow the Holy Spirit of God to provide healing where necessary. Uh, Lord, I, I ask that uh, Charleston Baptist Church will continue uh, to not only serve our community, uh, but Lord, as we hear the needs within our church family, Lord, that we would go to you in prayer and ask you to to show us ways that we can serve and support our church family. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us has intentional margin of time to dedicate to your service. Lord, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this opportunity to worship together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven 
and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven.
it's so good to share God's word with you this morning. If you would open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 8. Hosea chapter 8, if you're joining with us on campus this morning and you don't have a copy of God's word, I would encourage you to look underneath the seat that you're sitting in or underneath the seat in front of you. There should be a blue Bible there. I would encourage you to take that Bible, open up to page 842. 842, that's where we'll be this morning. We'd also encourage you to take that Bible home with you. We pray that you will study God's word throughout the week. And if you choose to worship with us on any given Sunday, bring that Bible with you as we study God's word together. Uh, Before we open up the word this morning, let us uh, ask the Lord to bless this time. Lord, as we come to you this morning, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, we would take the heart of the psalmist in Psalm 86, Lord, that we would ask you to teach us your ways, Lord. Let our hearts uh, be united in delight towards you. Uh, Lord, whatever it is that you reveal to us through your word and through your spirit, Lord, I pray that faith uh, would be our guide. Uh, Lord, that our faith and trust would be in you. And Lord, where there's places of confession and repentance and renewed trust in the gospel, Lord, we pray that that would happen in this place and with those joining with us online. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Uh, We are halfway, halfway through our study through the book of Hosea. And I pray that it's been a a beneficial study for you as we study, uh, in many ways, a difficult text, if you will. Uh, But God is showing us his faithfulness time and time again. And so as we uh, continue our time through the book of Hosea, really unpacking God's redeeming love uh, for his people. I would encourage you, if you've not been able to uh, be a part of all the messages, go to our church website, subscribe to the church podcast, pick up uh, on those messages that you were not able to be a part of, because I think it'll be tremendously important for you as we continue to study uh, through this passage. So we're going to look at all of uh, Hosea chapter 8 this morning, and we find ourselves in a a somewhat pivotal part of the the book of Hosea. Uh, In many ways, this is the 11th hour. Uh, This is the point of no return. If God's people uh, choose not to uh, humbly submit themselves to uh, the teaching of the Lord through the prophet Hosea, uh, things are going to happen. And God in his grace, and I think that's important, every time God gives a warning, right, he has his holiness on, on one hand and his love on the other hand. These aren't competing with one another. They're united together. And so when we hear the warnings of God, we see that from a God who loves his people. And so we are going to see another warning again today. But again, these warnings are going to be escalating because where we're at in biblical history is we know from historical point of view in 722 BC, the Assyrian army is going to come from the north and is going to take over the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And here we're about 11 years before that. And so the time is ticking short, right? And when we think about years, right, we we think about uh, uh, the divided kingdom's been happening uh, roughly at this point for about 200 years. It seems like an extremely long time, but remember, in God's economy of time, that's just a short period. That's a day. That's a breath Right? And so we tend to think, oh, we got all the time in the world to make adjustments, right? Well, that's not the case. So we're about 11 years out from 722 B.C. when the Assyrian army comes in and takes over uh, God's people and puts them into captivity. And so we find ourselves in that 11th hour, if you will. God's people need to make a change, and maybe that's where we're at this morning. That God in his grace has been giving warning after warning after warning. And, and through the book of Hosea, as we study this word that you're seeing signs of God's warning me because he loves me. Now we have to make a choice. Are we going to choose to heed that warning and submit to him? And what is it that keeps getting God's people in trouble? What is it that gets you and I in trouble uh, in life? It's self-reliance, right? There's a part of us, in all of us, that desires to call the shots, right? We, We want to call the shots. We want to run and rule our own lives, And that's exactly what keeps happening in the book of Hosea. The prophet Hosea has been ministering there, or will minister there for 40 years. The prophet Hosea is the last prophet before Israel ceased to exist when the northern kingdom is taken over. So this is the last one, right? Praise be to God, we have Jesus, right? Jesus is coming, and he's already here, and he's coming again. And so we praise God for that. But in this point of biblical history... It's self-reliance that continues to get God's people in trouble, and it is self-reliance that will continue to get us in trouble. And so 
Think about that idea of self-reliance. We'll see it unpack in Hosea chapter 8. And then after we finish uh, verse 14, we'll talk about some takeaways as we uh, wrap up. So we begin in verse 1 in a very similar way that uh, Hosea 5.8 uh, read. And it says this, set the trumpet to your lips, right? So there's a warning call that's happening. The army is coming. We're, we're about ready to be attacked Hosea is the one in the watchtower. He's the one on guard. Again, he's the one that's been prophesying to the people of God. Uh, he will for 40 years again. He's the one that's saying, hey, be careful. Watch out. Take notice. Things need to change. God is speaking to you. But deaf ear after deaf ear is happening within God's people. And the scripture says, again, God's concern for his people out of his love is I need you to listen. And that's exactly what's happening here. The scripture goes on to say, One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. So think about a vulture for just a moment. We're familiar with turkey vultures, right? We live in Charleston, South Carolina. They're the ones with the red heads, right? Uh, in, the, in the Middle East and where Israel is at, that's not the case. They look similar to this. Uh, so you have a, a vulture, and the top picture is a vulture, how it flies. It looks kind of beautiful, right? And the scripture says that this, these vultures are, are basically flying around the house of the Lord. Now, they fly around. They swoop around. Why? Because they sense death. That's why they're flying around. So anytime you see a vulture flying around in Charleston, what is it sensing? It's sensing death is on the way. And uh, I don't remember what the names of these people that study vultures. People do that, but that's amazing. But they can sense death for over eight miles away. So they're sensing death, and so they're swooping and flying around. But what's the purpose of that swooping? They don't just want to swoop to swoop, right? They're ready to go in and, and get the meat, if you will. And so that's the bottom picture there. They're, they're, they're feasting. They're, and they're, what the Scripture is teaching us is that the Assyrian army is like that vulture. They're swooping around, but they're looking for that moment where they can actually go in and feast on the death, the decay, in this case, of God's people. Now the question is, why? Why are they sensing death? The scripture says, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. God's people are in trouble. Why? Because they're being disobedient to the Lord. They're sinning against the Lord. That the phrase there, transgressed covenant. Anytime you hear covenant language in scripture, everything points back to a relationship, right? God desires a relationship with his people. And so when you think about covenant, you think about relationship and what's happening. Remember what we saw in Hosea 1 through 3, this picture of Hosea and Gomer, his bride, his faithfully unfaithful bride. That is the picture here. God's people. God desires a relationship with his people, and they are being unfaithful. They are transgressing the covenant. The scripture goes on to say that they rebelled against God's law. They were doing what they were not supposed to be doing. They were being disobedient. And the scripture says in verse 2, To me they cry, so talking about the people of Israel, To me they cry, My God, we Israel know you. Verse 3, Israel has spurned the good, the enemy shall pursue him. So in their spiritual blindness, in their self-reliance, they claim something that isn't true. They say, We cherish the Lord. We cherish you, Lord, but the reality is that they are spurning against the Lord. The, the good here is God himself. They're rejecting God. So on one hand, in their self-reliance, they're saying, we cherish you. But on the other hand, what's happening is they're actually rejecting him. Not only that, in self-reliance, they're selecting their own leaders. So they're, they're calling the shots, if you will. We see that in verse 4, the first part. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princesses, but I know it not. So they're disregarding God's will. They're making decisions based on what they want, what they desire, what they see. And if you look at uh, the history of Israel for just a moment, remember it was, it was God's people that saw the other nations around them and said, hey, we, we need to be like them. We, we need an earthly king, right? Rejecting their heavenly king. We need an earthly king. We, we want to be like other nations. And remember how they uh, elected Saul, if you will. Everything was the outside, right? He, he, he looked like he played the part. But where did that get them? It got them in massive trouble. And the very next king that God raises up is David. Now, David wasn't perfect by any means. But God shows us something extremely important in how David came to the, to the throne. God says, I see the heart. I see the heart. And think about how we decide things in life. 
especially when it involves people. When we think about leadership, we think about those who are the most charismatic, right? The ones who can put on a great show, the ones who can attract the crowds, the ones who are in the, the in crowd, if you will. What is it that you can do for me? And if you can do for me, then that's the one I want. And what do we bypass in the whole process? One, we bypass what is it that God truly wants? What is it that God truly wants? And, and I think this is an important lesson for us. When we think about who's getting voted in and out, uh, I, I don't want to go on this rabbit trail, but I think it would be important for us to realize this because sometimes we misunderstand proper theology. We are not, I got to be real careful here. God has not commanded us to vote, right? That's important. Do we have the freedom and the choice and the privilege? Absolutely. But God has not commanded us to do that. What has he commanded us to do? He's commanded us to seek his will. He's commanded us to delight in him, right? And so there are times where maybe, maybe instead of being burdened with the command to vote, which is not true, we should be burdened with the truth of what? Seeking the Lord. What is the heart of God in the process? And regardless of who is elected, we're commanded to do what? We're commanded to pray for them. We're com commanded to make sure that, that we do our role to reflect the light of the gospel. Now, that in and of itself will radically bring about tension in our life because we've been misplaced. Again, God has not commanded us to do a lot of the things that we think he has, but God has commanded us to seek the will of the Lord, to pray for those in leadership, regardless if we care for them or not, right? And that's what's happening. God's people, time and time again, are not consulting the Lord. Why? Because of self-reliance. We want to be judged. We want to do what we think is right. We want to bring these people into power because we think they're going to give us what we need, right? But not only that, in self-reliance, they're creating their own gods. Verse 4, the second part, into verse 6. With their silver and gold, they made idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. Now, or how long will they be incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel, a craftsman made it. It is not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. And so these people, the people of God, their, their lives were full of worship, but it was false worship. And they, they spent a lot of money on this. When the scripture says that these craftsmen made these things, these are the finest craftsmen that were known at the time. And so you talk about the investment that is happening in here. And the scripture says that, that you are creating all these things, but they're not God at all. Now, we live in America, right? We, we don't worship a golden calf, or we don't worship calves. But there are other things we do worship. There's things that we invest a lot of time. We think about sports. We think about work. We think about all kind of relationships, achievements, recognition, all these other things. We worship those. Why? Because in self-reliance, we think that those things are going to give us what we need. The reality is anything that you cherish, right, above the Lord, that is a false idol. That is something that you're choosing to worship, but that thing will never satisfy you. Your most cherished idols are made by you, and they're made by me. They come from the depths of our own hearts, the places that we feel like will give us security and fulfillment and approval and all those things. And God says, in your self-reliance, you're going the wrong way. And then God says, how long will they be incapable of innocence? It's kind of like, how long will the guilty go unpunished, right? That's kind of what that's telling us. They treat these things like they're God, but they're not. And then in verse 7, for they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. This particular verse happens throughout uh, places within the scripture, and it's reminding us that all actions have consequences. Like this idea of sowing in the wind is, is a positive thing, but in this case, it's a very negative thing. Think about it like this. Uh, think about a gentle breeze for just a moment, right? A gentle breeze. You, you go throughout your day, and you'll get that gentle breeze, and, and most often, gentle breezes go unnoticed, right? You don't really acknowledge those things too much. So is it with little sin, right? A little bit of sin, right? A little bit of adjustment according to God's word. That's not that big of a deal. It's not going to cause any harm. But that gentle breeze becomes noticed when it becomes what? A whirlwind, right? A tornado. Nobody recognizes the gentle breeze, but everybody recognizes a tornado. The same is true when you think about sin. That little sin that you think is dormant that nobody's going to know about sooner or later is going to be what? It's going to bring about tremendous consequence. And sometimes it's the small sins that bring about the greatest consequences, right? And that's what's happening here. God's people are thinking, oh, it's okay. It's all good. But, but they're not going to benefit from their sin. The scripture says, 
The standing grain has no heads. It shall yield no flour. If it were to yield, strangers would devour it. So God is saying, there's going to be no benefit in you living in sin. For one, it's not going to grow. And if it does grow, the things that you, the crop that was grown is not going to be uh, partaked by you, but somebody else is going to come in and devour it. And that's exactly what happens with the Assyrian army when they come in. Not only that, in self-reliance, they lost their identity. Verses 8 through 10, the scripture says, Israel swallowed up already. They are among the nations as useless vessel. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers, though Ephraim is Israel again. Though they hire allies among the nations, I will soon gather them up. And the king and princes shall soon writhe because of the tribute. So the picture is, uh, the people of God think that in order to get their security, they have to pay Assyria off, right? So they make this gift to Assyria to somehow say, okay, if we pay them enough, they're going to uh, give us protection. They're going to give us safety. And that's not true. As they have gone to these uh, pl other places, Assyria, in the process, they're losing their identity. That's what's happening here. Their distinguishing marks as God's people are beginning to wane away. Their status is being removed. The thing that they once cherished so much, and again, God's people cherish their identity, is now being lost. Think about it like this. Great grandma's China, right? Fine China. Great grandma's fine China gets passed on to the next generation. Maybe cherish it, right? But sooner or later, what happens to great grandma's fine China? It ends up in a rugged box sitting in the garage, right? Maybe some of y'all have that, right? You lose sight of what one generation cherished now gets lost in the process. Why? Because you've lost your identity. The scripture says that God's people are like wild, uh, like a wild donkey wandering alone. A wild donkey has no purpose, right? They're not tamed, and they're wandering alone. Donkeys need a partner, right? And what is the scripture saying here is God's people need a partner, but they're going out and they're hiring all these other things, these other people, these other partners, but I am the true partner. I am the faithful one. And so in their self-reliance, they're losing their identity. All the safety nets that they purchased they're not safety nets at all. And then in their self-reliance, uh, the answer that they sought was actually their problem. So how are they going to solve this problem? Uh, verse 11, Scripture says, Because Ephraim was, has multiplied altars for sinning, they have become to him altars for sinning. Were I, were I to write for him my laws by the ten thousands, they would be regarded as strange thing. As for my sacrificial offerings, they sacrifice meat and eat it, but the Lord does not accept them. So what's happening here? They thought the answer was more spiritual activity, right? But more spiritual activity never addresses the sin of the heart. It only fed their fleshly desires even more. Those places of altars that were supposed to be the worship of the Lord were places where they indulged more in the flesh. And the scripture says that if I were to write the Ten Commandments a thousand times, you would think it would be what? Strange. You would think it would be foreign. It reminds me of the book of Nehemiah when God's word was hidden in the wall and Nehemiah finds it and all of a sudden he realizes God's people have gotten away. Why? Because they are not recognizing the word of the Lord. And so these sacrificial offerings, these love gifts, if you will, that were to be given to worship the Lord are only to be given to worship themselves. And then we close with this in verse 13 and 14. Now he, speaking to the Lord, will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. Egypt was the first place that God's people were in bondage, right? Go back to Exodus. And so he's not saying that Egypt is going to take them over, but just like you were in captivity in Egypt, the Assyrians were going to hold you in captivity. For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities. So I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strong soul, stronghold. So in their heart, they said, we want to call the shots. We want to be our own God. They, the, the palaces that they build with their own hands, the fortified cities that they built and, and staffed with their own people, thinking that this would be what they needed. And God says, nope, all of those things, because of your self-reliance, those strongholds will be removed. God in his grace is warning his people. The question is, are we listening? The trumpet has been sounded multiple times. Are God's people listening? The gentle breeze is blowing and nobody is noticing it, but the tornado is coming and no one will ever forget it. So what are our takeaways this morning? As we think about self-reliance and, and ask yourself these things as we walk through these three places of self-reliance, you can rely on religious activity. 
in your self-reliance, you can choose to rely on your religious activity. The question is, is that really what you want to do? Is it really going to give you what you think it's going to give you? Jesus tells a story that addresses this very thing, this idea of religious activity. In Luke 18, this amazing parable, the scripture says he, speaking of Jesus, also told this parable. A parable is a story that has spiritual implications, and that's what's happening here. He tells this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So you have a group of people that are trusting in their religious activity, thinking that they're better than everybody else. That word contempt explains exactly that, that they made it tough for everybody else that they thought that they were better. They were looking down on them. And we're going to find out who these people are. That it's that attitude of pride that my, my religious activity is what's going to seal the deal. It's what's going to put me ahead of you in the line. So the Pharisee that we find in verse 10, it says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. So you have a Pharisee and a tax collector. And they're praying, right? Praying was a, a common practice in the temple. And what we find with this Pharisee, a Pharisee is the one who studies God's word. Right On the outside, they look great. They live a moral life, if you will. They're quote-unquote good people, right? And so the Pharisee deserved to be in the temple, if you will. But the tax collector, the one who nobody liked, he's the one that not only collected taxes, but often collected more than what he was supposed to collect. Nobody liked this person. And this person had no business whatsoever coming into the temple. But both of them are there. So you have the Pharisee who's on the varsity team, right? He's the captain of the team, if you will, and the tax collector nobody wants to be a part of. He's a thief. And then in verse 11 and 12, the scripture says, The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. So this Pharisee, who's supposed to be praying to the Lord, is really praying to himself. Look at all I've done. I'm so glad I'm not like this other person. I, I go above what the law requires. I, I fast twice a week, not just once a year. I fast twice a week. I give. I, I'm going to make sure people know that I give. So this, ta- this Pharisee is, is showing that himself that he is better than everybody else. And the issue with the Pharisee, right, the religious person who believes that religious activity is going to be what you need, they need the sinner, don't they? They need the person sitting next to them to be worse than them. Why? Because it makes them feel better. And so they, they actually enjoy when people are living in sin because for them, they can look at them and say, ah, I'm glad I'm not like them. And so that's what we have here. We have this nasty deception of the heart and self-reliance. They're relying on religious activity to prove that they're better and they're right with God. Then we get to verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Listen, the tax collector, according to the Jews, specifically the Pharisees, had no business being in the temple because they were ceremonially unclean because they dealt with a lot of the Gentiles, and that was no-no. And yet this tax collector is in the presence of the Lord in the temple, recognizing who he is and who the Lord is. And you see tremendous humility Humility to the point where he couldn't even look up to heaven. And he calls it what it is. God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. You see humility with the tax collector. You see pride with the Pharisee. In verse 14, Jesus says this, I tell you, this man went down to the house justified, talking about the tax collector, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be Exalted. The Pharisees' pride is what condemned him. The tax collector's humility is what saved him. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says it like this in Matthew 7. Listen to the words of Jesus, very strong, very to the point. They cut to the heart. Verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. That's an important phrase. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So these people, these Pharisees, prided themselves on religious activity. They profess the name of the Lord. They speak truth. They oppose evil. They promote good. And at the end of their life, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me. Depart from me. 
Why is that? Matthew 15, 8 and 9, Jesus says this, this people, the Pharisees, the, the ones who are relying on religious activity, he says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So all of that religious work, because their heart is not right with the Lord, because they have not placed their faith in him, all of that is meaningless. All of that is in vain. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, when Jesus says that, I want to know what that answer is. What is the will of my Father? Is it all the things that I do, right? Is that God's will? When it comes to salvation, is that God's will for me? No, Jesus clearly states out what God's will is for us when it comes to salvation in John 6, 40. For this is the will of my Father. Now we're getting ready to get the answer. This is important. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Amen. Do you see what the will of the Father is? Trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Self-reliance never gets you there, but humble submission to the Lord will get you there. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The second thing, in self-reliance, you can rely on man's wisdom, right? If you want to prepare your life in that way, in self-reliance, you can rely on man's wisdom. What does God's word say about this? Well, James, the half-brother of Jesus, attacks this, this idea here, uh, talking about wise planning, if you will. In James 4, verse 13, the scripture says, Come now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. In the original Greek, we really get the heart of this self-reliance. It says it like this. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and we will spend a year there and we will trade and we will make a profit. Right? This person has it all figured out. Right? They've laid out the course. In all of this, he sets the schedule, today or tomorrow. He sets the path, we will go to such and such a place. He sets the timetable, spend a year there. He sets the activity, we're going to trade. He sets the outcome, and we will make a profit. This person is thinking about themselves from their perspective. This isn't a bad plan, if you will. But what makes it a bad plan is what is not said, but what is not said. I, said, I think I said that same thing. It's not what is said, it's what's not said. God is nowhere in the picture, right? This person is doing their thing based on self-reliance. The word say there is in the present active tense, meaning that is the course of their life. Every single day, if you will. I'm making decisions based on what I think, what I think I need. Verse 13, they're talking about today, tomorrow, or next year, if they have control, right? Think about how we live our lives in self-reliance. We, we feel like we control all the aspects of life. Verse 14, the scripture says, Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Then he asks the question, what is your life? That's a great phrase. What is your life? For you are a midst that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes. We don't know what the future holds, right? It's, the, the issue is not planning, but wise planning. Planning with God in the picture. You see, in verse 14, James is addressing the sin of presumption. Like, I've got all these things laid out. All these things are going to happen according to what I've done. And here's the reality. A pre-planned life void of God will lead to an unprepared life when the future happens differently than you expected it, right? Think about that. Life happens and you have zero control over it, except for where are you going to place your faith? Who are you going to seek wisdom from? Verse 15, the scripture says, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. It's a reminder to us that the duration of our life is in the Lord's hand. If the Lord wills, we will live so is the direction of our life. It's in his hands as well. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And so James is confronting uh, the sin of self-reliance. He closes in verse 16 and 17. Is, as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Who is James talking to? He's talking to the church. He's talking to those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, and yet you and I, as followers of Christ, can live exactly this way. Self-reliance, doing what we want. Go back to that question. What is your life? Your life is a gift from God. Your life is bought with a price, and your life has an eternal purpose. Do you live your life like that today? I'm afraid that many of us have bought into that old Frank Sinatra song that says, I did it my way, I did it my way. If that is the mantra of your life, you're missing 
you're missing the point. Who will you choose to trust? The psalmist says in Psalm 37, verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Com commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. So the self-reliance of relying on man's wisdom. And lastly, you can, in self-reliance, you can rely on a faulty foundation. At the end of your life, you have to do, what is it that the foundation of your life is, right? What is your true foundation today? Is it based on what you do? Is it based on your career? Is it based on what you have, the things that you can control? Or is the foundation of your life Jesus Christ? At the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says these words in Matthew 7, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Think about this. There are some tremendous similarities in these builders. They both were building their lives on a foundation, right? They both hear the same words. Their lives will be tested, both of them. But the difference is one built their life on the foundation of a rock. The other one built their life on the foundation of a sand. And the sand may be fun to play in, but it's never a good idea to build your life on. Jesus is the only solid foundation for your life. And so you will not only face the test, of, uh, the test that come in this life, right, if it be bad health or whatever it is, but ultimately the ultimate test is the test of judgment, right? When you stand before the Lord, what is it that allows you entrance into heaven? It's the foundation, Jesus Christ. That is the only foundation that will stand at the time of judgment. The question is, how do I build my life on the right foundation? How do I do that? Well, in a parallel passage in Luke 6, Jesus says it like this in Luke 6, verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. What are the three things that Jesus points out here? One, you got to come to Jesus, right? If you don't come to Jesus, you're not building on the right foundation. So you have to submit your life to Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus. Place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And then it says that you need to hear. You need to hear his words. In other words, there's going to be a lot of distractions in life, right? But the only voice that matters the most that we get through his word and through his Holy Spirit is the words of the Lord. So we need to build, constantly build our lives on him. And so Jesus is gonna confront us with our distractions time and time again, because again, we're not immune to trying to build our lives on self-reliance. And then the last one, obey. Obey what the word says. The only thing that stopped the foolish man from building on the rock is he didn't obey. He heard the same word, but he didn't obey the Lord. I love the fact that Jesus has not left us to ourselves to figure out life, right? He has given us his word. He has given us his Holy Spirit. The question is, will we every day root ourselves deep in him or we choose in pride to be self-reliant? The scripture says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Be a wise home builder today. Why? Because the storm is coming and the storms are coming are you ready? Are you ready to stand? Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. As the worship team comes up and leads us in our time of response, God, God is warning us today. The trumpet has sounded time and time and time again. The question is, are we listening? Or are we going to be like the people in the Old Testament, stiff-necked, right? In our self-reliance, we're going to we're going to live life based on religious activity. We're going to live life based on our own wisdom, or we're going to live life based on the foundation that we think is best. Or are we going to choose to rely on the Lord, to trust in him? If you're a follower of Christ, if you're relying on yourself, your life will not have the peace that God wants you to have. It will not have the joy that God wants you to have. You're not going to lose your salvation. Ephesians 1, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Praise God for that. But God wants us to experience not only eternal life, but abundant life. And how does that happen? As we humble ourselves before him day in, day out. Now for you, if you're not a follower of Christ, 
and you're living your life on self-reliance, if it be religious, if it be wisdom in your own wisdom, or if it be on a faulty foundation, because you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when that judgment comes, you will have no place to stand. And unfortunately, unfortunately for you, your time will be done and you will have eternity separated from the one who loves you dearly. So I implore you, please today receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're a follower of Christ today and you feel like, man, I've, I've been building a lot of my life on myself, confess your sin, repent of your sin. Remember, life is a gift. Your life has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and your life has eternal purposes, eternal purposes. Let us not rob God of the glory that he's due because we're choosing to live life on our own. Whatever your decision is today, I'll be up front. I'd love to pray with you. The altar will be up, open for you to pray, if you will. You can pray where you're at, but whatever it is, let us just stand and sing to the Lord. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that Thou bidst me come to Thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark cloud to thee whose blood can cleanse. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood and I'm welcomed with open arms praise God just as I am just as Yes. 
desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I welcome with open arms grace. Just as I am. Thank you again for joining with us online and on campus. If there's anything we can do in helping you walk with the Lord, please stop by our next step area or fill out one of the online connection cards. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, I pray that you will sign up to help participate and help volunteer with our Easter egg hunt that's going to be happening on April 9th. It's going to be an awesome opportunity for us to invest in our church family and also into our community. Speaking of our church family, I do want to bring a person before you this morning, Leah Espinal. Uh, she has uh, chosen to be a part of our fellowship, and I'm so thankful for that. And if you would affirm that decision, if you would, just say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. As we close out today, would, would you just be honest with the Lord this week? As the Lord reveals self-reliance in your life, will you acknowledge that that's what it is? And will you confess it and repent of it and just trust in the one who is the one that actually holds your life secure in his hand? All of us struggle with it, all of us. For some, it keeps you out of a relationship with the Lord and ultimately eternal separation from him. For others, it keeps us out of fellowship with the Lord. Though the relationship is intact, that fellowship has been fractured. And that's where the beauty of the cross is, that we can have fellowship with the Lord every single day. Praise God for that. Let us pray. Lord, we are so thankful for this morning. Thank you for our study through your word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you through song and through prayer. Lord, thank you for allowing us to celebrate uh, with Jacob this amazing uh, profession of faith uh, declared to the community of faith and to the world that he identifies with Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, his family and those who have been a part of that journey with him. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we continue to walk together uh, in life, Lord, we would do so uh, just trusting in your word, uh, Lord, holding each uh, one of us accountable. Lord, let us uh, carry the burdens of life together, Lord, but also let us do the responsibilities that you have given to us as individuals. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. <laughs>